RF man here. Um, I've had many of you ask me about operating either the single LD MOS amplifier or the dual LD MOS amplifier from 12 volts. And some of you have done some research and found that these 12 volt to 50 volt converters are quite expensive. So I've been experimenting with some of these units I found on eBay. I'll kind of zoom in on that. Okay, these basically can convert 12 volts to 50, 60, 70, even 80 volts, depending on uh, the application. They're, they're adjustable, um, but they claim they can deliver 20 amps. And through my load testing, and you can see I have some very substantial loads there, and I've got a very uh, hefty 12 volt power source. I've got the three uh, 800 watt 12 volt power supplies in parallel. Um, so I've done the load testing on individual units and also on units in parallel, two in parallel. And basically at, at, at 50 volts or so, uh, kind of zoom in, I'm at 49.8 right now. They, they can in fact deliver 10 amps. So I believe that these are suitable for the application. I've done the load testing on several units, kept them under load for 10 amps for an extended period of time, and they were able to perform reliably. Um, they are air cooled. There is a heat sink and a little cooling fan on the bottom there of each one. Okay, so they can produce 50 volts DC at 10 amps. 10 amps plus, um, and I'm satisfied with the load testing that I've done, uh, but there are a couple of other concerns with, with these modules and just with power supplies in general. When you're using a power supply on its own, uh, generally it can regulate properly, um, you can filter noise, etc. But these particular units when you use them in parallel, you have a load sharing problem. Okay, one of the modules is gonna basically produce most, if if not all, the output current, and the other remaining modules will, will output very little current. So, one of the main issues is load sharing. The other issue with these type of converters, these are boost converters, and basically all the energy comes. Out of, the, out of the inductors that you see here, these large inductors here, uh, most of the energy comes out of there, those inductors. And these particular ones are used in flyback mode. So what that means is that you're switching these inductors at 100 kilohertz, switching frequencies quite high, and we'll show that on the oscilloscope in a few minutes. Uh, you're switching them at 100 kilohertz, and when the magnetic field collapses, all right, that's when you're inducing energy into the inductor and producing the proper voltage output. Now there is a pulse width modulator on there that's used to produce the right output and also you can see a number of filtering capacitors. But because of the flyback events that occur in these particular devices, you get a lot of a lot of noise. Um, so I'm going to go ahead now and uh, hook up my oscilloscope here. And this is the the output unfiltered. Just bear with me here a moment. Okay, what you see here is the DC output of these boost converters with the filtering that's on board, you see some large capacitors there, but you still get quite a bit of noise. And if you look at one cycle, basically I'm at five milliseconds per division. So a full cycle is 10 milliseconds. So one over the period equals the frequency, right? So the frequency is 100 kilohertz, right? One divided by 10 microseconds. So that pulse that you're seeing, that larger pulse there, um, 
is, is from the flyback event. And the smaller pulse is from the switching frequency. Okay, so how do you filter that out? What's, what's an effective way to filter out not only the low frequency component, but the high frequency component as well? So let me just go ahead and change the time base. And here you can see, if I re-trigger the scope, you can see we have a high frequency component there and a low frequency component. So how do we filter that out? What's an effective way to filter this out? I'm looking at about six volts peak to peak on the high frequency component. Okay, this would generate quite a bit of noise in any transceiver, even one that's well filtered. So we need to filter that out. Well, the best way to do that is to use what's called a common mode choke. And there are a number of different types of chokes available. Uh, Coilcraft, coilcraft.com offers a very wide selection of common mode chokes. And if you go to their website, you can actually request free samples. They'll send you two samples free of charge, so you can do some experimenting. Now, I guess one obvious question is, well, how do I, how do I pick the correct one, right? Well, I'm using, for this demonstration, the CMT-3 series, okay? And I'm using uh, a couple of different types. Um, I'm going to demonstrate one today. Uh, it's the CM. T3 4.4 15L. So it's the one listed on the bottom there, and that has a 15 amp rating. So how do you select these? Well, you need to select one that has a high attenuation and high impedance at the switching frequency. So the website's designed really well. They actually provide the curves for these. So you can go and look at the curves and see, okay, how much attenuation do I have? So this is the curve that shows the attenuation for the choke that I'm using. And it's about 38 decibels or so. So there's, there's quite a bit of attenuation for the low frequency component. And you also see the high frequency component up around 100 megahertz, okay? The attenuation is even greater okay it's 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 very close to if we look at the scale there try to focus on that it's about 45 decibels so this would be an ideal choke to use to filter out the noise that we're seeing okay so I'm gonna go ahead and take my oscilloscope I'm gonna move the scope probe from the input side the unfiltered side to the filtered side okay and what we see here is quite a bit of attenuation not only for the low frequency component but also the high frequency component but there's still some noise there as you can see let's re-trigger on that you can still see there's there's quite a bit of high frequency there okay remember i'm at one volt Per division so let's look at ways to filter that out okay so to filter out the high frequency component what I've done is I've added a 104 a 0.1 microfarad capacitor to the output of the common mode choke this filters out the high frequency and you can see there's a substantial reduction in the high frequency component. So this is one method. Uh, usually for high frequency, a small value capacitor is used. You can calculate the amount of capacitive reactants using the appropriate formula. It's one over two times pi times frequency times capacitance in farads. So if it's 0.01, it's going to be a decimal place, uh, six zeros and a one. So, small capacitor typically is used to filter out the high frequency component. You can see it's quite effective there. Um, but we also have a little bit of ripple left. 
from the low frequency component, the 100 kilohertz switching frequency. So we'll go ahead and take a look at how we can filter that as well. Okay, so what I've done now is I've added a large electrolytic capacitor to the input of the common mode choke. All right, this helps to filter out the low frequency component, which is the switching frequency, the 100 kilohertz. So basically we have our common mode choke in series with the positive output. And then we have a large electrolytic, it's 470 microfarads at 50 volts. You could use 470, 1000, it's not that critical. This is typically referred to as a reservoir capacitor. So I think some of us might be familiar with filtering AC with a full wave bridge rectifier and then we add a capacitor to filter out the ripple. Well, this is basically doing the same thing, same job. Uh, as, as a capacitor that's used for filtering, say, a 60 hertz AC signal. So that takes care of the 100 kilohertz, okay, and then, of course, the high frequency component, we use a smaller capacitor, okay. And this one should have a high enough impedance so you can calculate what the capacitive reactance is with the formula and ensure that the impedance is high enough to provide attenuation of the high frequency component. So that's what the circuit looks like. We've got a series inductor and two shunt capacitors. Okay, so if we go over to the oscilloscope here and we, we re-trigger, okay, we can see that the ripple is now somewhere around 100 millivolts or so. Okay, so that should be adequate for most transceivers. Uh, they do have input filters, so they can filter out some input noise, but you can see that the reduction using this methodology is quite substantial. We went from six volts peak to peak to about 100 millivolts peak to peak. So quite a significant reduction. Now here's a close up look of the actual common mode choke that I'm using. So you can see the part number there. Um, basically, it has a 15 amp rating, so it's adequate for, for this design. We're, right now, we're under load at about 5 amps, but remember, we, we probably need 10 amps from each module. So that's the choke. Now, how does it basically work? You can see that it, you have two inductors wound on a single toroid. Okay, one's for the positive side and the other's for the negative side. And there's a current canceling effect that occurs because they're both wound on the same toroid. So you're filtering out the common mode noise. That's the noise that's on the positive output, okay, and the noise on the negative output that are actually in phase. There's also something called differential noise okay where the noise on the positive and negative lines or rails or out of phase and this provides some attenuation as well when you check out the website and look at the curves you'll see that all common mode chokes also provide some impedance and attenuation for differential noise but in power supply designs particularly flyback we're concerned with the common mode noise and that's what we're filtering out with this topology all right, so this is the RF man. Uh, once again, a good website to check out these common mode chokes is coilcraft.com. Again, they have a good selection and they have a data sheet there and they can actually uh, provide some tools for further design, some software tools free of charge. So it's a good website, good resource, and uh, wish you all success with this. Uh, I will be posting another video on the load sharing problem, so please look out for that. We'll talk about some techniques to uh, evenly distribute the load on power supplies and these boost converters. Thanks.